What's good, everybody, and welcome to Buddy Bag Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Thomas, and with me, as always, Brooke Brighter Dave. How we doing, everybody? Well, gang, in our ongoing pursuit to piggyback off the success of other authors and podcasters, we have yet with us another special guest. He is the author of such novels as The Window, a slow burn cult horror novel, as well as Voodoo Child, and his most recent novella, Potted Plant, an ego horror revenge tale. He also hosts Into the Gloom, where he narrates stories from other authors and holds interviews as well, some of whom have actually been on this podcast. Actually, all of them have been on this podcast. (laughs) He got to him first. With us, ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Gloom. Hello, hello. I'm honored to be on this. I've also listened to y'all's episodes, and, you know, I I enjoy listening to the thoughts of uh, Haley and Spencer and Jamie and I guess was Brian here for a conversation too? I I think that she posted a link about a Spotify interview. Was it you guys or was that someone else? Uh, it wasn't us. But Maybe it was really- someone else. I saw it in passing, and then when I I went and yeah. I was like, why are they not uploading it to Overcast? Like, what what's the deal here? So I I guess she's that was someone fun. that I I'm gonna message and try to get on here soon. So. Definitely yeah. bring Brie Morgan on because yeah, she's yeah. she's awesome. You'll she have a lot is, of fun with her. Yeah. It's fu- it's funny you mentioned because I was j- listening to her and you. That was the last one I was listening to as I was kind of getting set up for the interview today in this episode, and I was hesitant to do that intro because when you were talking to her, you said, "Well, I don't like to do that whole listing off people's accomplishments, and you know, I like to let it go naturally." I was like, "Well, shit." <laughs> now now that is nothing that i am personally against that's just the decision that i made on into the gloom um and i think that it'll be interesting because most of the people that are coming on like my first you know 12 guests that are going to be on there mm-hmm. i know them fairly well so it'll be interesting yeah. once i transition to interviewing authors that i might not know so well if mm-hmm. that maybe changes a little bit we'll we'll see do you already have a, a good lineup set up yes Yes, I do. <laughs> I've, got, I've got quite the backlog. We're, nice. we're, we're in the middle of trying to get ours kind of sorted out. We, we have one more guest after this and then our season finale, which we're actually going to have Jamie, Haley, and Spencer on all at the same time. And we're nice. Gonna, we're going to talk yeah. about Stephen King books. I support that. You're yeah. more than welcome. You want to, if you want to, you know, join and get the gang all here, you're more than welcome to come and join us. <laughs> hey, if you want me to, to come along, just let me know the time and place. That might actually work out because if we have four people, then you guys can divide up into teams and I can see how well you guys actually know Stephen King trivia. Yes, I am <laughs> down go. and I'm, I'm, I'm fine being on a team with any of those three. <laughs> okay. But it's so funny because when I was listening to the podcast, when I was scrolling through your episodes, I was like, "Oh, he had Jamie on. That's pretty cool. Uh, we had, we had him just uh just last week. Oh, uh, there's Haley too. Oh, that's for kind of coincidence. So, hey, he, what the hell? He also had Spencer. <laughs> it's funny because we went in the same order as well. Did Spencer, we? Haley, Jamie, right? Is that the order? No, uh, we had uh, after Haley. We had Haley first, then Spencer, okay. and then Jamie. Yeah. So we didn't so I'll, copy your style. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be honest. I haven't listened to Haley's episode yet, and and she knows this, but it's because I want to watch The Tingler before I listen to it, and I haven't watched that yet. She actually she mentioned it at the end of uh, her interview on Into the Gloom, but yeah, I still haven't watched it yet. I was about to say spoiler alert. She talks a lot about Vincent Price. <laughs> we talk yeah. a lot about Vincent Price on that episode. Yes, yes, I I, I wouldn't it. doubt it with her. <laughs> I'm 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 fairly certain that Mr. Price is probably not dead, but in her basement, tied up somewhere. <laughs> it, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. If she has found the 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 fountain of life, then she's using it to keep Vincent Price alive. So, Dave is going to talk a, a little bit about your books. But before that, I want to talk a little bit more about the podcast Into the Gloom. So generic question, but we got started randomly because he contacted me via Facebook. I didn't know who he was. Yeah. We were on the same horror group on Facebook. That had yeah, like, I just posted I was looking for someone to co-host with me. Like tens of thousands of people. Yeah. And I just happened to be like, go on. And then that's how we got started. We're I still haven't met this dude in person. No. <laughs> and how did the Into the Gloom podcast start? What made you want to start doing that? Um, I mean, honestly, I just, I love horror and I love talking horror. And, you know, I've met so many fine horror fans and authors on Instagram. And 
it was we were having these conversations in private and then you know i even had a couple zoom calls and it was just like why why aren't we recording this like i feel like this could be beneficial to you know just people that love horror but also other authors and it also gives me an excuse to sort of you know talk and and learn more i was i was inspired by the talking scared podcast and so Neil constantly talks about the fact that he is unapologetic, that he feels that as a fledgling author, that he needs to talk to other authors and learn from them and grow with them. And so that was his excuse to really get them to sit down and, and answer his questions. And so his his interview style definitely inspired me and, and the way that I run the podcast. But it was just something that I wanted to do for fun. Now, obviously, you know that I am an author, but I also do some audiobook narration. Mm -hmm. And it's also an excuse with my bonus episodes to allow people to hear my audio narration. And so, you know, there's a there's a business bend to it as well. But if I can have fun, and I'm not just, you know, selling stuff, then you know, I'm going to move forward with it. And that's the long and short of it, really. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this too. Of course, when you start a podcast, you do have that thought in the back of your mind, like, what if this becomes like one of the most successful podcasts ever? But at the same time you go, but the second it stops being fun is when I'm out. It's because yes. th yeah. that's why we got started. Right. I'm very much the person in my like group of friends, which I'm sure you guys are, that yeah. the second you go off on a tangent with a movie, you don't realize you've been talking for two hours about something that nobody else cares about, even though... Right. Like I've just listed off all of the fun facts and trivia off of like this one movie alone. Yeah. And people are just sort of like, I mean, they're really, they're either really into it and you can tell that instantly or, or their eyes are just glazed right. over. And it's just like, who's going to shut this guy up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 no. But you don't understand. Like, don't, don't you think it's funny that they called the Jaws robot flaws because it had so many issues during the filmmaking process. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um, you, I'll, I'll go ahead and plug this. Actually, should I? Are you guys going to steal him and get him on here before me? Um, baby, I actually, we, I have, uh, have some, we maybe have him already. Who are you talking about? <laughs> I have Jake, uh, Jay Alexander coming on in the future to uh, talk about Jaws. And yeah, I'm really excited about that. I don't know if you know this, but he is a huge Jaws movie nerd. Dave, write that down, right? <laughs> write, write it down. Get, get, him on, in, get on the horn possible. right now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh wait did, that name sounds familiar did, uh, I think nick harper he, oh yeah we, we uh i think jamie mentioned him at some point yeah yeah he yeah. did he did he's he's yeah. um another one of our spooky friends <laughs> hey, you know what again i'm happy to take your scrap just, yeah oh, as soon as you're done with him just, just uh, send him over our way yeah you know, there's so much to talk about spooky friends yeah so you had mentioned the other podcast that you listened to as well are there any other podcasters that you listen to to kind of get ideas of well maybe not to take formatting but kind of figure out all right what makes them a little bit unique what can i do to kind of set myself apart yeah you know like i said neil mcroberts just his style and his it's it's very personal it's very friendly and i really appreciate that so i i follow the lead there with talking scared and then i really appreciate just the dialogues and the deep dives into horror that the guys over at this is horror that podcast and that's been going for years you know that's that's a well-known solid one they've had some really big names on there um but i Honestly, I listen to so many podcasts. I do listen to a few other horror podcasts, but I also listen to a lot of more author focused podcasts as well. And, you know, at this point with Into the Gloom, you know, I, I have a little bit of a format. I like to, when I have somebody on, I like to give them the opportunity to choose the topic or the theme of the show. And so we talk about that in the middle of the podcast. I do like to, you know, segue into giving them a platform to talk about their own writing and then sort of at the end, wrap things up and then, you know, take them to the Carpenter Shed to talk about my favorite horror director, John Carpenter, and, you know, the King's Corner to talk about my favorite horror author, Steve. 
Stephen King. And, you know, that's that's really it. So each each episode has that outline. But I think that each episode is very different. I think the guests, as they come on, they they give their own unique flavor to it. And I really appreciate that. And I hope that I can keep that going and that it doesn't get stale. At this point, with the people that I have coming on and knowing them and their personalities, I think that they're going to be able to bring something new to the table with each episode. Even if only five people ever listen to this podcast, I'm glad for it because we got to meet a lot of interesting people. Exactly. Yes. We've had some good conversations on here. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've, you know, I've seen y'all's y'all's growth as well. And I, I think that you're meeting more than five people, <laughs> but that's a good mindset yeah. to have. Once again, it goes back yeah. to the thing of why am I doing this? And if it stops being fun, and if all you're focused on is numbers, then it will stop being fun. But if you don't care about that, and you're just here because you love it, and you love horror, and you love connecting with other horror lovers, then you know, you guys will go far. And and I'm excited to see, you know, your future guests and the future I'm, movies that you're talking about. I do like the fact that you guys you know, I talk about movies in, in Into the Gloom because I love them, but you guys really focus on the movie aspects and do those deep dives. And those are also some podcasts that I, I listen to as well as those, you know, just yeah. two hour discussions about a movie that, you know, maybe came out 40 years ago. Like I'm, I'm here for yeah. that. I'm terrified to go back and listen to our first episode of Fear Street because I know, right. I know that we've definitely improved since then, but that Fear Street trilogy episode. I mean, I'm glad that we took the initiative to be like, all right, just we don't know what we're doing, but just we have to start somewhere, just dive into yeah. it. Yeah. I think eventually we gotta go redo Fear Street, do it a little justice. Yeah, maybe go redo it, but you don't have to go listen to the one you already did. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Yeah. No, I have to. I'm a I'm a masochist. <laughs> yeah. I'm a masochist. I have to listen to myself and like oh yeah. why did i say that but we maybe we'll do a fear street trilogy where we'll do three separate episodes each talking about the episodes we'll figure something out yeah i'll figure it out but speaking of a segue to give authors a chance to talk dave has some questions about your book actually the first one is about your podcast intro sure like you mentioned that uh john carpenter and stephen king are in the twilight of their careers so how what dare direct- you yeah what director and author do you think is going to be next to kind of fill those voids that they leave ari aster i love his films you know hereditary was absolutely horrifying it was one of those movies that did something to me that normally doesn't happen anymore because i've been watching scary movies for so many years and you know i think all of us horror yeah. fans at this point were very desensitized but that movie when it was over i was just sort of sitting there and i didn't know what to think i didn't know what to say i didn't know what i had just watched and I really appreciated that. And okay. it's also, he's the type of director, whether you're talking about Hereditary, whether you're talking about Midsommar, there is so much going on. There are so many little details, so many things yeah. that he slips into the background and so many connections that the rewatch value is very, very high on his films and i feel that john carpenter is is similar so i i would yeah. say aster um is definitely one that i have my eyes on were those movies both a24 productions yeah yeah and that production company is just killing it and they have that's been what i was years. gonna say a24 i think is stepping in and really th- I th- what was their last movie that the one with the lamb child do you know which one i'm talking about are you talking about antler is it antlers the, where a person gives the, birth to a goat child I'm not sure. I haven't. I haven't seen I think it's Antlers called, or I think read it's it. Called, but, I think it's called yeah. Antlers, but they, but they take very out there concepts for movies and are not afraid to run with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. not even horror, like outside the horror genre. Like I just, I love their films. Um, I don't know if you've seen a Ghost Story. It sounds like it's a, it's a horror movie, but it's not. And that movie just tugged on my heartstrings, and I loved it. All right, I'm gonna have to check that one out. Yeah. And so to answer your other question in terms of an author, it's really hard for me to answer that because it depends on the mood that I'm in. And also, you know, you're asking like, who is maybe going to take that mantle in the future? Yeah. Um, the, the first person that comes to mind, I think, I don't think it's a future thing. I think he is here. He has arrived. And that would be John Langan. I really, okay. really appreciate John Langan. He just brings this visceral yet beautiful prose to his writing. And I love the way that he can weave up a legend. And um, I, I really appreciate that. I do like Adam Neville as well, just because I'm a big fan of folk horror. And I think that he does a good job of that. But once again, it depends on my mood. If I'm wanting story, I'm probably going to go with 
John Langham. If I'm wanting atmosphere, I'm probably going to go with Adam Neville. If I'm wanting character, you know, when it comes to character, I think that a lot of indie authors are just killing it. You know, we've already been talking about a number of them, but uh, someone that we haven't mentioned yet that I did hear Jamie mention on on a past episode with you guys was is uh, Michael Goodwin. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, he, yeah he's someone to watch out for uh, as well. And if you haven't yeah. read his short story collection, um, How Good It Feels to Burn, definitely check that out because it is mm. awesome. And I don't think there's a bad story in that collection. Um, okay, yeah. Two, th two things. The movie is called Lamb, by the way. Okay. okay. Watch the trailer. You'll be like, what the hell am I? What is this? It, it, it's very much A24. And two, I know the question was directed at him, but I would have to say you want to throw in Mike Flanagan into that mix. Yeah, oh, yeah. It too, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Put put his name up there because, you know, I just a few weeks ago, I watched Midnight Mass. Absolutely loved it. Just powerful and, and religious horror to the core, unapologetically. And I know some people yeah. didn't care for that. But for me, I think there's a lot of religious religious horror right now, quote unquote, whether it's books, yeah. whether it's movies. And I think they're just sort of plastering that on there. And the, the religious aspects are very lacking. But with Midnight Mass, it was front and center. And he didn't shy away from it. And I really respect yeah. that. But really, all three of those Netflix uh, series were just amazing. And the, so you know, I, yeah, I have those short story collections, story with horror and heart. And I yeah. believe that heart belongs in horror. And yeah, Mike Flanagan kills it with all of those. I, I, I've, I cried at different points in all three of those, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Yeah. <laughs> Cinematically, I love the Haunting of Hill House when I, when I yeah. saw that too. That was, he has one whole episode where it was all done in one shot. And I was, I, I always love those, that kind of fancy stuff yeah yeah and we'll you'll we'll be talking about that here shortly with yeah, the, yeah. the long cuts in halloween too yeah, yeah. anyway uh continue dave you just recently published a novella called potted plant what was your uh, inspiration behind it I'll make him blush. I mean, and he already knows some of this, but honestly, Spencer Hamilton and I have gotten pretty close over the past number of months. Yeah. And we we stay in touch almost every day chatting, whether it's on IG or whether it's via text. And we try to, you know, meet up via Zoom where we're going to start doing that once a month just to sort of encourage each other and inspire each other, move forward. And one of the things that I really appreciate about Spencer's writing is obviously I had him on as the first episode and we talked literary horror. And I feel that that is one of his strengths when it comes to writing. And it's something that I've always enjoyed, but I never considered myself to be too good at it. And so when I started The Potted Plant, my, my goal was to, you know, craft a story that people would know, hey, this is a Thomas Gloom story. But at the same time, I wanted to try to make it a little more literary. And based on the feedback that I've gotten so far, I think that I was able to accomplish that. And so, you know, Spencer's writing really inspired me on that front. But then the other thing too, is that this was one of those stories when it comes to all the stories I've written, whether it's short stories, whether it's novels or novellas, I sort of have followed different processes in yeah. terms of how I have written them. And this one, it started out, I had a couple concepts and ideas, but I didn't really outline it. Um, as opposed to something like Voodoo Child, which was yeah. very much outlined from the start of things. And so it was sort of a, a mix. I knew where I was going. I knew where it was ending. Because if you've read that, I sort of start the story at the end and then back up and, and lead us back to that. And then the closing scene is back there, you know, with, with the narrator holding this yeah. plant outside of a door. And so I had that idea from, from the start. And then I just ran with it. And okay. I really put a lot of my heart and soul into it. And when you start talking about the emotions like loss, revenge, and just feeling yeah. embarrassed and shamed and cheated, all of that slips into it. And that that really is what kept the story going forward. You know, I, I think that when it comes to my writings thematically, I tend to write cautionary tales and yeah. this one you know from the opening dialogue i mean I, i'm talking about you know revenge and anger and the fact that if, if you don't deal with these things terrible things can happen and so this is my yeah. cautionary tale of hey this is what can happen if you give in or you choose to fight against revenge all right so that was a great answer and i'm actually excited to read the potted plant but i'm currently reading the window mm. Yeah, I was going to start with Spotted Plant, but I heard that your podcast with Haley and you guys are talking about the window. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to check that one out. So how far into it are you? I'm about 120 pages in. 
Okay. Okay. So you have no idea yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll just say that the, the, the first three fourths of that book are very different from the last quarter of it. Okay. Well, you have a layered character like Mark, who's kind of going through things, but he also has a past where he struggled with addiction. Mm-hmm. What kind of research went into creating a character like that? Um, It really didn't take much research because a lot of those struggles with Mark are based on my own struggles from the past. You know, he he was struggling with methamphetamines. That's not something that I specifically struggled with, but I've had friends that have. And, you know, I've struggled with with addictions in the past. And also, you know, he struggles a lot with with anxiety and, and paranoia. And that's also been, you know, a constant struggle that I've been working on myself. So yeah, the research just came from really reflecting on my own life and processing a lot of that through my writing all right like they say you know write what you know and mark's really into them and my last question before we get into the movie can you kind of describe how you got, ended up in a uh, audio narration yeah so i've always loved reading stories i mean even when i was a little kid you know i was constantly asking my mom to read me stories and then once i got to the point where i could read i'm like you know hey mom let's sit down and let me read you a story <laughs> And I've always just loved storytelling and I have been gifted with the vocal cords that are in my body and people are constantly telling me, you know, that I need to be on radio or podcast or narration. (laughs) And so starting my author career and moving forward, you know, my my goal is I want to be a full time writer and part of being a full time indie author specifically is really you have to be an entrepreneur. It's not you just sit around and write and then the books sell themselves. You essentially have to sell those books. You have to sell yourself. And I think that's one of the strengths when it comes to the indie author community is that readers can actually get to know the author on a more personal level and connect with them. And so I've just tried to lean into that the best that I can. And, you know, people in the author community and readers, you know, people always comment on my voice if I send a, a, an audio recording on IG or something like that. And then finally, I was like, enough people are saying this. Why don't I utilize that? And so really the, the idea for the podcast and the audio narration came about at the same time. I was initially just going to narrate my own stories, but I realized that there were other needs out there from other authors. And so I've been... And narrating other people's and and honestly, my goal to become a full time author, I know that my being willing to do audio narration as well is only going to help me get there quicker. And I love doing it. I enjoy it. And so I'm just plowing forward with it. I'm going to continue narrating my own. And so far, I've, I've been able to narrate some really, really awesome books. When I was looking into you, and I was going through your episodes, I was like, all right, so he's had our he's had our guests before. Okay, that's fine. Well, how how long has he been doing? Oh, he's been doing this longer than uh than us too. Damn it! All right, well, well, how does he sound? Damn it, he sounds fantastic. Do we have anything over this guy? Yeah, you, you do have that. Good yeah, you know, voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough because we all have different gifts. We all yeah, have different yeah. talents, things that that we're good at. And I'm it's just easy. joking, by the way. I'm not yeah. frustrated. I'm just good, like, good. Yeah. Because just it, it yeah. is easy, though, to, to compare ourselves to, yeah. to other people. But you know, like I said, from what I've heard from you guys, and the podcast that I've listened to, I, I do, I think that you will go far. And I think that you are bringing a unique perspective. And I do, I really appreciate and and I'm sure I can speak for the other authors that have been on here. I like that you guys are making a point to sort of give authors a platform to talk a little bit about their writing and yeah. themselves and their career. Um, I, I think that that is, is really, really cool. And mm-hmm. that is something unique to you all, as opposed to, you know, all these other movie talk podcasts that exist where they have a guest come on and it's just straight into the movies. Well, you guys are very much doing us a favor by even being on the yeah, bringing more viewers to us. So because I think when me and Dave started and we we were just doing straight up movie reviews, we were like, you know, we I think we need a third person here. We need a, a we were still very much trying to find our dynamic and our yeah flow with each other. So when we had Haley on for the uh, as our first guest, we were like, all right, now this is good. Yeah, having a third person to kind of bounce off mm-hmm. as a in between me and Dave is a is a yeah. good kind of thing. Plus, I, I love a chance to promote any because me and Dave are trying to write our own anthology right now. And yeah, we know that it's tough. So trying to give a platform to anybody who's making books, 
I appreciate content creators, especially ones that, you know, like authors, it, it's tough to write. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you guys are getting the benefit too of, you know, you when you when you have us on, mm -hmm. um, you're also getting our audience too. And hopefully the the goal is that the people that that love the Thomas Gloom brand will come on and listen to this episode, but then they'll like it enough to go back and listen to the other ones. And that's how yeah. you grow. That's how you move forward. It's, it's all exactly. about networking. And exactly. We, and we get some friends along the way. Right? Yeah, yeah. you guys are doing it in a way that this doesn't it doesn't just feel like a sales pitch and and that's that's cool so yeah i'm 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 excited to be here with you guys and to talk about my favorite movie of all time and that leads us very nicely yes, into halloween cool. then i'm good with segues uh, yeah. I'll, I'll i'll take it yeah. <laughs> i was like there you know go. what good i don't have to be like well let's go ahead and move on and so, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, it's definitely in everyone's top five this movie when it comes to horror you know what michael just you know halloween might be over but michael is far from dead he's still making his appearance here on the show this will be our fourth halloween movie that we've reviewed we we did a special episode where we defended rob zombies halloween and mm -hmm. season of the witch and we reviewed halloween kills so everybody was tiptoeing around it i think everybody just didn't want to be like well if we just did you know the original halloween everybody's doing that you cowards you wanted to do the original halloween you wanted to choose it but Thomas yeah. Bloom was uh, the first one to say, you know what? Yes, let's talk about Halloween, the original. Let's do it. Yeah, and because I can talk about this movie all day. But I will say that I am a big fan of Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. You know, I, I know that there's some hate yeah. out there, but We've amazing. Been, we, I, have, <laughs> I, I told Dave, I want to do a special episode where I defend Halloween 3 because it gets way too much unjustified hate. Yeah, yeah. I'm still a person that I think it gets a hate just because of the title. If it wasn't called Halloween 3, it wouldn't get nowhere near the amount of hate. Yeah, well, that's what happened when it came out. That's why everybody yeah. poo-pooed all over it, is because they were waiting for Michael Myers, and he never showed up. And, th you know, this was a time when there wasn't the internet. It was, you know, people saw the title and expected something because the last two had Michael Myers. And yeah, you know, he, there was an explosion and fire at the end of Halloween 2. But, you know, he came back after one as well. So he's going to come back again. Even John Carpenter wanted the idea of an anthology yeah. having a different yeah. thing. So I was, my whole point was saying, you know. If the father of Halloween, John Carpenter, is fine with no Michael Myers from here on out, I think everybody else can get over it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I really hate that he wasn't able to move forward with that vision. I mean, it, honestly, he didn't, didn't want to do part two. He wanted yeah. to end it and then move on to another, you know, story that takes place on Halloween. And yeah, I, I also think... pointed that out. I said, like, if they did Halloween 2, it would have worked out better because then yeah. they wouldn't have the expectation for Michael Myers. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, from, you know, from a yeah. business perspective, I understand the studio yeah. wanting the second one because, you know, yeah, you make yeah. a movie on less than half a million and you make, you know, 40 million plus like, OK, yeah. that's a home run. I guess they were yeah. right, though. I mean, we just had Halloween Kills. Yep. Yep. It keeps on going on, which I actually yeah. I, I really liked Halloween Kills. I, I think I liked it better than Halloween 2018, but. I guess that's probably another topic. What did you give it, Dave? I think I gave it like a 16 uh, out of a scale of 30. I, I'll, I'll introduce, I'll I'll introduce uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the awesome scale to Thomas in a little bit. but I, I was in the 20s, though, because I really enjoyed Halloween Kills. Yeah, me too. Me yeah. too. I said it was a very fun average slasher film. I just enjoyed the storyline of, you know, mm -hmm. fear oh. turning the people into a monster that they were scared of. Yes. Yeah. I, I just, and I'm also I'm a sucker for nostalgia, you know, like with the the new Star Wars movies. I know that a lot of people complained about, you know, like, ah, there's too much fan service. Like, give me all the fan service. I'm I'm good with yeah. it. <laughs> but this isn't about Halloween kills or is nor is it about Halloween three. This is about the original John Carpenter's Halloween. So I'm going to go into this a little bit differently and assume that if people are listening to this, they've more than likely seen Halloween. Because usually we give a synopsis uh, or we give a, uh, this is what happened. Breakdown of the movie, yeah. This movie came out in, was it 78? 78, yeah. yeah. This movie came out in 78. Stop it now, then go go watch it and then come back. Because we'll be talking, <laughs> spoiler alert, Michael is very much alive <laughs> by the end of it. Yeah. So, Just in case you didn't you didn't know, you know, yeah. all these other successive movies that has come out. Yeah, My, Michael isn't dead when the movie ends. The shape <laughs> It's just the walked same. away. Yeah. Even though he's shot him six times. Uh, <laughs> Evil never dies. Evil. <laughs> 
So John Carpenter, brilliant filmmaker. In fact, Dave, get out of here with this. But, you know, The Thing is my favorite John Carpenter movie. Mm. And you can shake your head all you want, Dave. But <laughs> what do you think sets Halloween apart from all the other horror movies? There are a lot of great ones, especially of that era, that puts it as your favorite. Yeah, so I, I appreciate a slow burn. Mm-hmm. I appreciate suspense. I'm a big believer in once you show the monster, it becomes less scary. You know, the monster that that we have to imagine and create in our mind is always going to be scary than the monster that we can see with our own two eyes. And so I, I feel that John Carpenter did a really good job of adding that mystery. And he was able to accomplish a terrifying film without a ton of gore either. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I talked about that with with Brie when she was on that I'm not a, I'm not big on torture porn gore. I can take gore. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think that it can be used just as the scare because, you know, maybe the writing isn't isn't very strong. But for John Carpenter to be able to do what he did on such a low budget with such an amateur crew, it was really amazing. And so from the start, I've got a lot of respect for the movie. And, you know, then when you start watching it, it's just it's hard for maybe newer horror fans to realize this or people that aren't familiar with the history of horror, but this movie was groundbreaking for its time. You know, slasher films are everywhere and have been for decades, but this movie was the spark to light that. You know, we wouldn't have Friday the 13th. We wouldn't have Scream. We wouldn't have a lot of these movies that are so well known and maybe have even, you know, in certain people's eyes grown bigger than the Halloween franchise, but it all started with John Carpenter's Halloween. I imagine it had yeah. to be shot just within the first couple minutes to see this kid just kill his, his some of his family because you just see it from his perspective at first and you see like the killing going on and then you take the mask off. It's just a little kid standing there with a knife. Yeah. 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 Because it's it starts in 1963 yeah. and then we flash forward to, you yeah. know, present day. And that uh, again, that scene is so groundbreaking because it is it's a long shot. Now, there are three cuts in that. You, you, you got to watch for them. But when, when, when the mask is first put on in front of the camera view, there is a cut there. Yeah. And then uh, turning away uh, after the knife has been picked up, once again, there's a cut there. But still, to have that shot go for so long and the way they were able to do it was to use, you know, that Panavision Steadicam, mm-hmm. which at yeah. the time had just come out. I mean, it was brand new. This is, you know, this is sort of when you're talking about the the Steadicam and John Carpenter, it would yeah. sort of be like our generation talking about Christopher Nolan and IMAX cameras. And, yeah. and so he took a risk there and it really paid off. It set the tone for the movie in a powerful way. I don't think people really appreciate, I mean, they might look at it in the theater and go, oh, that's a cool shot. But the amount of work it takes to make a long shot seem like there are no cuts and to hide them within certain things where you can't tell yeah. where it is is so hard to do especially for a long period of time and, yeah and yeah. it's one of those things that i appreciate because sometimes i don't realize until after i'm done watching or well no, usually after about like a minute i, I start to realize wait a second I don't, I don't think there's been any cuts here. I, th- I think this the whole thing's been going on for a while. And then, then I'm, yeah. but once I'm more aware of it, then I appreciate it more. But man, I don't think th- those are probably my favorite kind of shots. There are a lot of cool, fancy shots in cinema. I think that's probably my favorite just because of how much work it takes to make a long shot like that. Yeah, yeah. Definitely and, agree with that. And I think one of the, well, let me ask your opinion because one of the criticisms that people have with Rob Zombie's Halloween is that they gave Michael a backstory Mm -hmm. and they gave him a reason why he kills he oh he was abused as a kid and he grew up and he just the way his dad treated him and his mom was a stripper and he grew up messed up in the head whereas we don't know he was just a regular kid in the original john carpenter he was just a kid that went crazy which do you prefer villain whose backstory and reasoning we don't know or ones where you kind of sympathize and understand for me i I like a mixture. I like to start not knowing. But if a movie is, um, especially if it's a franchise, if there are going to be multiple films, then I think that there's power in learning more about the killer. 
And every every bad guy, every villain, they think that they are doing the right thing. You know, nobody thinks that they are the bad guy. And in order to, as an audience, you know, as a reader, as a watcher, in order to really feel that and understand that, like you, you've got to know some some backstory. And that personally, yeah. I'm a big believer that for the most part, monsters aren't born, they are created. And so learning some of that, I think it's important. And that doesn't mean that you have to feel sorry for, you know, the, the, the child killing cannibal, but you can, you know, at least understand that something has happened here to lead to this. Yeah, I'd say so. But in this movie, I think it benefits from just not knowing that he's just pure evil behind his the fact black that, eyes. Yeah. The fact that this kid was just, just a regular middle class america kid we don't know the reason i think it was part of the scare factor is just because it could happen anywhere at any time kid just went crazy and just decided to kill we don't know why he just he, he just decided to yeah yeah not having a reason can make things scarier and and then you know with part two with the whole you know brother sister angle that comes into it 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 does feel a little ham-fisted mm. yeah i wish i could go back and actually start watching the halloween franchise with halloween because i think the first one i watched was four so by the time i got to the first one i already had some like backstory that came from two mm, yeah yeah yeah, for me, it's it's uh, it's a miracle that I fell in love with this franchise because my first introduction was Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> oh God! I actually oh. saw like before I when when did Rob Zombie's Halloween come out? Was it two thousand seven? Yeah, 2007? I think so. Yeah, seven or eight. Before I think I saw that one first. Before I even before I started getting really into horror movies, like analytically, I think I saw uh, Rob Zombie's first, and then I was like, well, you know, I should probably go and watch the original. Yeah, yeah, I I didn't see the original until I'd seen most of them. I'd I'd seen I think I I did um, Halloween twenty years later after Resurrection, and then I saw four and and bits and pieces of five before I ever even saw the first one. And then from there, I watched the first one, the second one, and the third one. So that was cool. One thing I want to say, too, I seem to be alone in this also with the Rob Zombie one. Now, Dr. Loomis, everybody loves Donald Pleasance. He was a, he was great in the Halloween franchise. Yeah. I, I thought Malcolm McDowell did a pretty decent job as a Dr. Loomis, but I seem to be I agree. in that. No, I agree. I definitely agree with that. Um, he, he did he did a great job, and that was that was one of the bright spots for me. Now, I don't hate the Rob Zombie films. You know, they they bring their own i mean it's rob zombie you know he, he definitely made we said a that rob it's, zombie film we weren't saying that they were cinematic masterpieces just that like if you were to take all of the halloweens and line them up i don't think rob zombies is the worst no 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 i um my my ranking is Hall john carpenter's halloween Mm -hmm. Halloween 2, Halloween 3, Halloween 4. Probably now it would be Halloween Kills mm -hmm. and then Halloween 2018, then 20 years later, then Rob Zombie's Halloween, then 5 and 6, then Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, and then Halloween Resurrection is at the bottom. Which one is Curse of Michael Myers? Is that above or six. below? Oh. Yeah, 6. Uh, I, I actually, I like 6 better than 5. There are parts of 5 that I like, yeah. but... Did you see There's both all... versions, the producer's cut and the theatrical cut? Yeah, yeah. I, have you seen it yet, Dave? Because I told you that the <laughs> yeah, a lot I of people seen... say the producer's cut is way better than the theatrical cut. I haven't okay. seen the producer's cut yet, but Yeah, still... I've got the, the box set that has all of them, and it has both of those films with Curse, uh, with Six. And yeah, the producer's cut is definitely better. Once I saw the producer's cut, it did... it. It leapfrogged part five in my were you, ranking. Were you like, why wasn't this the one that they released? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that tends to happen. Whenever there's a, a producer's or director's cut of a film that comes out, it's just like, oh, oh what the hell happened here? <laughs> kind of like with the uh, Justice League when that happened. Yeah. I, I, haven't, yeah. I haven't seen the Snyder cut. Oh, now, so with that Snyder. one, it's more understandable because I, I think that overall it was a runtime decision. Most people aren't going to sit in a theater for, for that long. Unless they're like, you know, Shia LaBeouf watching all their own films. So we'll say that to Lord of the Rings fans. or so. <laughs> Yeah. They will sit and plant themselves down for four hours. I'll watch the trilogy, you know, and then and then go into The Hobbit. But yeah, I thought Malcolm McDowell was a good Donald Pleasant replacement. Yeah, yeah he, he does, does a, a decent job. job. It's just an iconic role, which makes it hard. I thought he was better in the first one than he was in the I thought he got very pre-Madonna-ish in the second one. Yeah. yeah the second one kind of goes off the rails. 
if, <laughs> yeah, that one's wild. Even if you're a fan <laughs> of the first Rob Zombie one, which I thought was okay, I watched the second one. I was like, all right, what 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 are we doing here? What, what's, yeah. what's, what's going on? This here? is yeah. This is I went into the second one thinking it'd be like the original Halloween two, kind of like how he met. No. Yeah, you Completely start off different. like that, right? It's yeah. like, oh, okay, we're we we we've got some hospital. Oh no, this no. Is just the director is taking us on an acid trip. Yeah, why don't we talk a little bit about Jamie Lee Curtis? Oh man, she is, she is, and in, in my mind, she is the final girl. You know, the final girl trope. It's had its its peaks and valleys over the past few decades. I think yeah. we're at another peak right now with, you know, some of the titles that have been dropping, especially. But she, in in my mind, she started it. You know, she she really moved this thing forward. This is a random question, but does, does anybody know when uh, When a Stranger Calls, when that came out? The original or the remake? The one with, uh, oh my God, I'm going to be ashamed for not remembering her name. High-pitched voice, uh, the original. Uh, actress um it came out in 78 Did carol kane carol kane ah man i'm yeah. so upset that I, I love carol kane i completely blanked on her name so that i mean i cheated i i pulled up letterbox <laughs> i i kind of figured but yeah. so that came out the same year a year later a year later but that was back when the babysitter alone at the house trope was was really strong yeah yeah, well, essentially, you know, before when they were putting this movie together, it was supposed to be, you know, the babysitter murders and John Carpenter didn't even come up with the Halloween idea. Somebody slipped that to him and he ran with it. It was really when you look at this film, it is it, you've, you've got these these babysitters and the story is yeah. focused around them and what happens to them on this one night. And yeah, that's that, that is a trope that's powerful. And once again, though, yeah. it it sets up the babysitter to be this sort of damsel in distress and and a heroine at the same time yeah exactly because that that's how it starts you're worried for her but then once again if you if i i think if you've done the final girl trope well then you have her stand up to the evil to protect the children that she is watching and that's what jamie lee curtis you know laurie strode yeah she exemplifies that and it's amazing amazing because she she's terrified she's freaked out she's horrified through all of this but then at the same time anytime she reacts with those kids it's firm it's i'm here to protect you i will not let anything happen to you do as i say and it's just like you know uh, uh michael myers you 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 can terrorize me and my friends all you want but it stops with these kids and that that's awesome that's amazing dave yeah sounds, that is awesome he sounds like leslie vernon talking about final girls the way he's talking yeah. about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but this segues to a question for chris because chris hates kids which kid was more annoying i don't hate kids <laughs> <laughs> I hate certain kids in horror movies. The kids in Halloween and the original Halloween, I thought were fine. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I thought Tommy Doyle and his uh, his little girlfriend were fine. All right, I yeah. figured I'd ask which one annoyed you more. Oh, I yeah. like Tommy and Lindsay. Yeah, I like yeah. their camaraderie too. How they they can bicker and argue, yeah. but then when they settle on something, they team up. And that's you know that's yeah. a scene with Laurie Strode too, where like you know they're 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 scaring each other, or Tommy is scaring Lindsay, and she's like, "No, you can't do that." Blah blah blah. And then by the end of it, it's like you know like, "Oh, let's go watch this movie," and they just leave her behind. She's just like, "What." What just happened? I thought I was in control of this situation and they teamed yeah. up on me. Yeah, I like that part where he's like, after that, he was like, no one believes you. I believe you, Tommy. Yep. <laughs> oh, how adorable. Yeah. yeah. What did you think of, you have Paul Rudd who played Tommy Doyle and then you had Anthony Michael Hall who played Tommy Doyle. What did you think of the, the, those two portrayals? Definitely two different. Yeah, I think... I think that they both did great. You know, obviously, if you're talking about the the canon of the films, part six isn't connected with Halloween Kills. So yeah. it's essentially a different character. It's sort of, you know, what, what would happen if Tommy never got over the fear and instead just gave into the paranoia? Yeah. Um, what would that look like as he grew up? And then the other one is, what would happen if he let let his anger supersede his paranoia and his fear what would that look like definitely two interesting takes on both the on a single character yeah but i mean you know if you really think about it odds are and if this were to happen in reality tommy would probably end up more like tommy in halloween six just broken i, I mean that is a trauma a traumatic experience to go through as a young child <laughs> like i can't imagine 
And then you throw a thorn yeah. cult thing in in the mix too. Like he he's going to be all screwed up after all of this. Like there's cults involved now and, yeah. and magic. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it never stops for him. The terror never stops. It just grows. But I think this movie benefits from having one of the greatest scores of all time. I was just about to say that. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of John Carpenter's greatest strengths is the scores he creates. Yeah, I know that after the movie was filmed, when he was showing it to early critics and early audiences, it didn't have the score and nobody thought it was scary. But then the score was added and it literally changed everything. And I'm I'm a big fan of John Carpenter as a director, but I'm also a very big fan of him as a composer. And I love that he has the ability to not only direct, but to compose the music, because I think that those two, you know, the director and the composer, they have to work hand in hand if it's going to work. And for him to be able to do that on his own really just gives him an edge that not many people have. And for me personally, I owe a lot to John Carpenter, not only for my love of horror, but also when it comes to my writing, because I'm the type of person that I I need to be listening to music while I write. But I also can't be listening to music with lyrics because it just it it sneaks into my writing and it distracts me. So I listen to a lot of ambient stuff, a lot of movie soundtracks. And John Carpenter is one of them that I have on on repeat. And I wore out the fog soundtrack while I was writing The Window. I listened to that so much. And even now at this point, after writing and publishing that novel, whenever I watch The Fog, I instantly have memories of, you know, being in my back room, being nighttime, having candles lit and just, you know, writing and dreaming about this, this story that would become my debut novel. That's the third time, Dave. That's the third time we've mentioned the fog on this thing. We keep tiptoeing around it. And... Eventually, we're going to have to get into it. Bring oh. Thomas back to get into the fog with us. I love that movie. I just I just rewatched it again a few nights ago. I, I keep telling people, though, to, cause we brought it up when we were talking to Spencer about The Mist. And yeah. I asked them both, have you all seen the fog? It's very much the same kind of, well, you know, there's monsters out in the fog and whatnot and uh, he- in a hectic town and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, we haven't seen it. And then somebody keeps mentioning it every single podcast. I'm like, all right, this might be fate just telling us, all right, we have to make that like, even if we have to do a special movie review, uh, we'll do the fog. Well, I'm going to watch it tonight because I don't have plans. And I was going to watch it last night, but I got distracted. So I'm finally going to watch it tonight. And I'll let you guys know what I think. I love it, man. To me, <laughs> like it is the perfect ghost story. If you if you are a fan of Stephen King, yeah. you will love this because Ooh. it's it's got that 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 small town feel and and there's legend built into it. And oh yeah, it's really it's really good. And once again, the soundtrack, man, the soundtrack just ties the movie together. It's so spooky. Who is this you mentioning? Stefan King. Stephon? Who is this? Stefan mm-hmm. King. Who? That Stefanovich. Kingly, Let's yeah, I don't know. Some some guy. He's written some a guy, yeah. Man, some up and know. some up and comer. He must, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another indie author, right there. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask, because within the past year, we had a new Candyman movie. Mm-hmm. We had a trailer for the new Scream coming out in January. Mm-hmm. Halloween Kills came out. So everybody is reviving old franchises right now. Child's Play TV show. Child's Play yeah. TV show, which I, which is going to be my next binge watch. Me too. What horror franchise do you think should officially retire? Do you think there should be a limit on how much we... Because now, because Halloween, again, it's been since 78. It's been 40 plus years ago, wasn't it? If you, if you had to choose one to be like, all right, I think we've done everything we can with this horror franchise. I think it's time to let it be. Um... I'll give I'll give two responses. Okay. For two separate reasons. Th- this will be my response for one that maybe I can't fully speak to because I haven't seen the last two films that came out in the franchise, but that would be Saw. Um I've seen all of them except the last one that came out. I haven't seen Book I, of Saw yet. Yeah. You I don't did. need to watch them. Well, I guess I need to. <laughs> I would tell you guys right now, I felt like I wasted my time with them. Yes, I do. Well, I I think I saw the one before that, and I I was I you know I know you don't like torture porn, which is very much what a lot of the saw ends up being. But I I, I still get something out of it, probably because I started out. That was one of probably the first actual horror franchise that I really really got into because I just in the first movie that twist ending really stuck with oh, me, and I and I really so good. and I really enjoyed it. So groundbreaking I mean, right there. I, yeah. I'd say the first three 
are actually pretty solid. I can agree with that. But yeah, especially the first one, it's just, it's very strong, very strong. And, um, you know, for someone like me, that's not big on torture porn, that first one is not torture porn. It, it has a story and the mystery is just, yeah, it's executed so well. Anything, the payoff. It's a, lot of, a, a, it's a lot of mental torture, if anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, you were making your point. Yeah, um, I, I would I would just say saw, you know, I, I think that they've they've wore it out um, and they're I think they're they're grasping at straws at this point. Um, now, I will say this, that I'm not one of those people who gets upset when a remake is done or a new installation is made and you know people scream and yell like you've ruined the franchise blah 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 like i don't buy that Pe people are allowed to like what they like and i can in my mind you know if i don't like the new films i can just delete them from my mind i can pretend that they're not canon that is that is fine um but like i said just for me personally i feel like saw has had its run but once again the caveat is i haven't seen the last two but if I had to choose a franchise that I have seen all of them, and I know that a lot of people are going to be very upset with this, but I, I would have to say Nightmare on Elm Street, um, the Freddy Krueger story. I feel that it has it has done what it needs to do, um, and it's done a lot, and it's tried a lot of different things, and um, I think that they should just leave it leave it where it is. Yeah, I have to agree with that being one of my favorite movies, Nightmare on Elm Street. I would I'd be say excited if they brought a new one, but I. Don't think they should. I say I, I I'll agree with you on that, but I will say that if they did, did you both see the remake? Yeah, I think yeah. that if they were to actually have gone in on the idea that they were toying with in the movie, in that Freddy Krueger was a guy who was falsely accused of all yeah. of these things, but then at the end they just said no, he's he's he actually did all that stuff. I think that if they had kept it as a guy who was falsely accused, which is completely different from the original source material, then I would think that they have new area and new ground to play with, and I think that they could have uh, made some sequel out of that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and that's what. Like for me, I am a huge Star Wars fan and people have a lot of differing views and opinions on the new films. I like them. I enjoyed them. Uh, you know, even for, for me, you know, The Last Jedi was probably in my mind the weakest of the new trilogy, but still I think one of my all-time favorite scenes is in that movie, the throne room fight. I just, I love that. I love it. I love it. But what they're doing now with some of the, the spinoff films like, you know, Rogue One and the solo film. But then now, you know, they're going to be coming out with new movies that are outside sort of the, the Skywalker story and uh, yeah. that arc. <clears throat> I like that because if you make a big world, like play in it, you don't have to yeah. keep bringing back the same old characters and rehashing the same story and trying to put little tweaks on it. But like, yeah, what you're saying with Freddy Krueger, if he was innocent wrongfully accused like that changes everything and moving forward you know you can you can play with that and get the audience on the killer's such. side yeah. you could have had a whole story where some some kids or some, some started dying and it was and it's not even freddie it's somebody who knew freddie and knew that he was mm -hmm. falsely accused yeah I just I just pitched you a story right there that they could have done. <laughs> Hollywood, if you're listening, I just gave you a a, a multi million box opening box opening breaking whatever idea right there. But you blew it. You 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 had to yeah. make him a child killer, and you, you you had a good thing and you had a good idea, and then you just dropped the ball on it. Mm -mm -mm. But yeah, I think a lot <laughs> yeah. of a lot of franchises are they fall victim to what you're saying is if you go through the trouble of making a universe. That, that you could have anything in it. You don't need to stick with the same people over and over and over and over again. The universe is vast. You can do whatever you want in it. Make newer, more interesting characters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Take a risk. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's, that's the same thing that I say about M. Night Shyamalan movies, is that, you know, say what you will about his execution of his movies, at least the dude is taking chance on some scripts that, like, if you read the happening, like, on paper, it's like, all right, so, or if you were to try to pitch that idea, like, the trees are killing people, most everybody would have been like, that's garbage, get out of here. At least he took a chance and said, well, maybe I can make it work. 
Yeah. And I mean, that's essentially, you know, he was making an eco horror film before it was cool. And yeah, I mean, that that film definitely has its problems. Yeah. Um, I think that some of it were the the casting choices hurt Mm. the film. But I will always stand on this hill and say that one of my favorite movies, once again, because of the building of suspense and the waiting until the end to reveal the monster Mm. is Signs. That movie. I love that movie. And all the little intricate, you know, the, the things that were shared with you as the viewer that seemed like they didn't make any sense and little comments um and then for it to all tie together at the end like you sign me up for more like that plus the reveal of the alien like is just a quick little thing from a vh a camcorder haunting um, haunt. yeah, yeah that was a great way to introduce the alien i still get goosebumps when i see that because i remember the first time in the theater with my mom and my stepdad and it, it was horrifying because up to that point you you sort of you settled into you know, we're not going to see it we're, we see the shadow on the roof we see the the the, the little bit of a leg in the cornfield they're it's not going to be one of those kind it. of movies yeah. it's going to be one of those kind of movies where it's yeah. just it's it's playing on your uh, Beer, now yeah. do you th- do you think that they should have shown the full alien at the end no i liked what they did you know we we saw we saw the full frontal nudity of the alien in the vhs <laughs> yeah. uh in in the full camera frontal. that's what yeah at the R-rating. end at the end, just keep teasing us with the reflection in the TV. But I mean, once again, like that thematically is beautiful. You saw the alien the first time in the screen. And then the next time you're seeing it full on, it's still in the screen. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's yeah. cool. That's like a little thing that, you know, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, agree with that that, one. That's that's one, it's one of those movies. And he has it's some of those shots where it's like, all right, say what you will about M. Night. But the dude has talent in the dude. Yeah. In the, and again, I respect the dude for taking risks on scripts that people... I still need to see old. Me too. I still need to see old. I will say this, though, about old. I love the premise, but I think that they gave away that twist too early. I think that's something that should have been found out in the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's happening more and more. Honestly, I'm I'm a huge Halloween fan, obviously, but I didn't even watch the final trailer uh, because I felt like they gave a little bit too much away in the first trailer and I just didn't want to do it. They gave away too much away in trailers nowadays. And that's that's something that I'm bummed out about because I don't like spoilers. But yeah, it is what it is. It's not enough yeah. to just have one trailer, like especially with Marvel movies. You'll have like three, four, five different trailers. And it's like, all right, I mean, just just come out with one and then let the audience speculate. Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say that the Batman trailer, the most recent uh, one. That's a good trailer. Yeah. They show you so much. But at the end of it, you have no idea what the storyline is. We like, or what what's going is. on. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I think that Christopher Nolan did that really well with his Batman trilogy. Also, you get you got to see a lot of the big shots, the big events in the movies, but you didn't know where the story was going to go. I'm looking forward to the next Batman. And stop hate everybody stop hating on uh robert patterson twilight was so long ago and even <laughs> in even he didn't like the dude it, ha- so. the dude can act go watch some of his other movies he can act. yeah the dude can act yeah when everybody anybody complains about patterson uh pattinson being you know cast as batman i instantly know that they have not seen any of his newer films or any of his subsequent films after twilight because he's done He's he's got some acting chops. He was yeah. in he was in Tenant, and people didn't like the idea of Heath Ledger being the Joker when he first first casted. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he was the best Joker ever. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a fair thing to say. Yeah. What did you think about the uh, Scream trailer? Have you seen it? No, I haven't. Um, because I. I'm currently doing a a rewatch through because my wife hasn't seen those movies, so okay. I'm gonna hold off because honestly, the last Scream that came out, I. I can't remember if I've seen it or not. Um, so I'm I'm okay. I'm gonna hold off. I've only seen the first scream. Really? I, I, yeah. So January is gonna be Scream Month because we're in talks with somebody. If I'm not mistaken, Dave. Yeah, a couple people come on and talk about Scream. The when the by the time the new one comes out, so I'll yeah. probably cool. the week before that I'll I'll probably have a Scream marathon and start from. I, I will be a full on Scream aficionado by the time we do that recording because that's your favorite movie is that your favorite movie of all time horror wise dave favorite movie period a favorite movie period is scream yeah yeah i guess yeah <laughs> should we get back to halloween yeah <laughs> you know what that, we that, took uh exit somewhere and now we're lost 
Like, yeah, we get back on the interstate. <laughs> we went way out there. We've talked about everything else. <laughs> but that's what happens. That's what happens when you get three movie buffs in a room. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But once again, I think that this this is what John Carpenter has done. You can talk about his films and you can see the influence he has had across the board. Yeah. Thank, you, and, thank you for tying it all together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can count on me to, to do that. For segues but, um, and, and right. tying everything back together. You know, there's a reason why we went on a tangent with other movies. It's because we were trying to say that John Carpenter has inspired so many other movies. Maybe, yes. not, maybe not Saw, but... Exactly. I think that another really strong thing about John Carpenter's Halloween, or Halloween as well is that he made you care about the rest of the cast the other characters the quote-unquote minor characters yeah they had their own little stories going on they had their own drama going on whether it was relationships or you know their interactions with little kids i i think that that is something that the more modern slashers that started coming out into the in the 90s and into the 2000s that most of the extra people were just pigs for the slaughter. They just were just there to get killed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so what John Carpenter was able to do was, once again, I think taking a risk and obviously putting the spotlight the brightest on Laurie Strode, mm -hmm. but also looking at some of these you know, other characters and giving them their focus, giving them some screen time, giving them some interesting dialogue fun dialogue whatever whatever it might be you know really making um, you feel like you're a part of this small town and you're like i know yeah. these people yeah yeah like you know you know we all know alinda so you know totally we all totally know alinda oh, totally character. you know i was so happy when she died i was like i'm so sick for saying totally <laughs> Were you totally happy sentence? that she was uh, that she was dead but you know definitely she's, just, she's very self-focused yeah and she is very much interested in her boyfriend and Bob, you know, but we, we get our time with Linda yeah. and, and Bob. We get our time with with Annie and, and Lindsay and she drops Lindsay off and then, you know, Annie meets her her demise. But it's it's cool that they all they are all interacting with Lori and they're all right there. They're all on on the same street. Yeah. But, you know, Lori has that phone call with with Annie and then Annie dies. And so in Lori's mind, like Annie is, is good. She's okay. I just saw her. She, she brought Lindsay over here. And then she gets the phone call from Linda and her and Bob are fooling around and they're messing around and she sees, oh, they're right across the street. I see the van. I see the light on in there. And she's got the kids and she's worried about, you know, making the popcorn, carving the jack-o'-lantern, you know, making sure that they're not scaring themselves too much. And then that leads to, you know, it leads to this place where she starts thinking, wait a second, when is Annie going to come pick up Lindsay? Wait a second, you know, why, why are Linda and Bob over there having fun and I'm stuck over here with the kids, but then she's starting to notice they're not around, they're not connecting with me again like they were before You're figuring things out as she's figuring things out yes exactly yeah yes and then the once again i think that we've been desensitized when it comes to these slasher films there's always that reveal with all the bodies falling out from this tree and that yeah. thing and you know they're decorated in this way but the the first time i ever saw it was in halloween you know when laurie goes across the street she goes into the house and you know there's there's Annie and Linda and Bob and they're all just spread around the house. And in that moment, she realizes I'm alone. I'm alone. But then she realizes I'm not alone. You know, that's such a cool contrast. We get to know all of these characters so intricately. Michael is the most famous out of all these characters, but he's the one that we know the least about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the killer that has become such a icon is one that, other than him being a killer that escaped from a psych ward and killed his family, we don't know anything about him. The only we know everything about Lori and the people he killed, but nothing about Michael, which I think is a cool contrast. Yeah. And that was that was Carpenter's initial vision. You know, even when you get to the the credits of the movie, it doesn't say, you know, it says young Michael Myers. But when it comes to masked Michael Myers, it's not masked Michael Myers. It's the shape. And that's where he was trying to tie in this sort of supernatural element 
and you don't know much about him except that he seems unstoppable. He is very strong. Um, I also like that, once again, at the time, it was groundbreaking. Now, with all the true crime and the documentaries and the research into serial killers and, and sociopaths, we sort of understand their MO and how a lot of them work. But at the time, that wasn't understood in 78. And so to have this killer that sort of, he seemed like his, he was getting some sort of a possible sexual gratification out of the kills with his heavy breathing and some of the groaning that was going on there. You know, once again, nowadays, it's like, okay, we know what's going on. But at the time, like that must have been terrifying for the audience. Like, what yeah. is with this guy? Why yeah. is he breathing like this? Why is he getting so much pleasure out of this? And you don't know why. No, you, you, you don't have an answer. And then he shot, out why, yeah. falls out the window and disappears into the night. And, you know, if... If we can talk about the closing of this film, I love, love, love the closing because the characters are gone, but you are getting to retread all these different scenes of the movie, yeah. different, different shots, and it's empty. You know, you see the house that, that Lori is in, you see the couch where she first, you know, had her, um, the, the violent interaction with Michael and stabbing him in, in, in the throat with the, the sewing needle. You see the, the street, you know, all these different places where Michael was throughout the film. He's not there now. At least you can't see him. But, he but could be. as the shots are shown, the breathing gets louder and louder. Like he, he's not there, but he could be. Right. Yes. And that's that that was John Carpenter's point. And the movie, the, the 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 story was supposed to wrap up, leaving audiences with this feeling of is Michael in my car? Is Michael in my house? Is he outside of my is he window? That shadow yeah. that's moving off to, uh, uh, that in the corner of my eye that I saw. Yep. Uh, speaking of uh, real quick, one of the things I like to watch every year is Bravo's top 100 scariest movie moments of all time. And Halloween is up there and the scene I want to talk about that they talk about when everybody thinks Michael is dead he's laying on, on the floor having just been stabbed by Lori she sends the kids away and you are the way they talk about that scene is that I wish Halloween's one of those movies I wish I could go back in time and watch it in the theater yeah. with an audience yeah for the first time because at the time people thought you know, this is probably the end right now. We're probably going to get to credit soon. Michael's dead on the floor and Lori is just kind of breathing relievingly. And then just in the back, he just sits up. Dun -dun. <laughs> Dun -dun. I can only imagine that for 1978, that probably freaked so many people out and had audiences screaming in the theater. Yeah, yeah, because like you said, it, it, it hadn't been seen much before. You know, it, uh, uh, those of us that have seen the the other films in this franchise but especially the friday the 13th franchise there's so many you know fake kills of the killer but in this one yeah you've got you've got the stab in the throat with the sewing needle and then he falls down behind the couch she thinks it's over she thinks it's done and then there's the closet scene where she stabs him in the chest with a knife and then he's laid out and then he gets back up then he gets shot Six times. Six times falls out of a window. The second story laying on the ground. Once again, he's gone. when it goes back, he's gone. That had like that had to have been so unnerving that there's no resolution. Just none. none. The none. shape lives. The shape and lives. he could be coming to a neighborhood near you. I'm going to go ahead and kind of bring this around to kills real quick, Dave. OK, we usually end out if you've listened to our thing with a kill of a movie. How about kill of the franchise? Think of all, all the Halloweens that have been. Is there a particular kill that stands out to you in which you thought it was super cool or either like over the top or that's my favorite kill? Um, uh, I can go ahead. I can do mine real quick and circle around. Sure. It still might be. <laughs> I'll, I'll say uh, in, in this scenario, I'm going to exclude Season of the Witch but because we'll, we'll be talking about the Michael Myers movies so because i was gonna say season of the witch had that eye gouge and then rips the yeah the <laughs> bridge of the guy's nose out like that that one i don't know some for some reason that kind of stuck with me but i'll leave that one and i'll say um just because they were my favorite characters in halloween kills when he killed big john and little john and just Aww. and posed them as as their honeymoon photo i don't know yeah because he, he stabs big john like in the armpit and then yeah <laughs> 
that just makes me think that Michael is actually a hopeless romantic at heart. He just he, <laughs> <laughs> he has a softer the, side. He, he wanted to make sure that while as they were together in life, that they were also together in death. You know who's exactly. really under that mask? Ted Mosby is under that mask from How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I mean, there are a lot of really great kills in the Halloween franchises, just unique, just jaw dropping moments. But I'd have to say that Nurse Karen in Halloween 2 who goes down into the, you know, the hydrotherapy area of the hospital with old Bud. And, you know, Bud gets choked out while he's checking on the temperature and, it, and the water is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. We know that Michael has raised the temperature to a, a scalding temperature. Um, but then he comes out and just doesn't even drown her but is dunking her and pulling her out of the water and dunking her. And as it goes on, each time her face comes out, there's more like skin peeled back and flaking off because it's literally scalding her skin off. That was horrifying because, and and not just the fact of how he did it, but the transition from she's in there, you know, getting freaky with, with this guy. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a place where people go to alleviate stress and to find relief for sore muscles. And she's down there with someone not alone. And there's a love interest. And then to have that happen is just horrific. And even right before it happens, she thinks it's Bud standing behind her, but it's Michael. And she, I I always cringe too, because she takes his hand and she starts kissing and licking his finger. And you can see just how dirty and grimy his hand is. But yeah, that's pretty horrific. Pretty, pretty bad. You're just in your most intimate moment and, and you're most vulnerable. I guess yep. it's like getting killed while you're on the toilet. You just, uh, you're at your most vulnerable. And then all of a sudden you can't defend yourself. There's nothing to defend yourself with. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty bad. What about you there, Dave? One of my favorites would have to be an H2O. Mm-hmm. One of the girls takes the elevator to get away from Michael. And then he cuts that elevator and oh. oh, just completely destroys her leg. Yeah. That's pretty bad. Yeah. And she's, and just, she's crawling just crawling and her legs just like. Dangling, oh, dangling behind her, yeah, and, and then he just comes up behind her and stabs her. It's just, it's like you, you can't even run away. <laughs> just yeah. yeah, yeah, that's 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 pretty bad. I have a gore doesn't bother me, but I have a oh. thing with broken bones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that fits it for sure. And then there's um. Oh well, yeah. I don't want to add any spoilers here because it's a newer movie. But there, there's some, there's some bone crunching and kills as well. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm I also same. liked in a. Uh, Halloween 2018 with uh, Dr. Lewis's replacement where Michael just kills him. Yeah, and the, the, uh... the bathroom stall scene when he comes in, not even the kill, but just him dropping all of those teeth on the ground. Like, oh, man, I was like, oh. dear God, is Rob Zombie directing this one too? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. This. The way that yeah. you feel about like broken bones is the way I feel about teeth. Yeah. Seeing, seeing things get done uh, like with people's teeth and or get seeing teeth get ripped out or like punched in yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, Cause I get, I have dreams where my teeth fall out. So, uh, like, yeah. so I guess seeing that on screen, I'm like, Ugh. have you seen American history X? Oh, you're talking about the curb stop scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I know that scene. I haven't, it's been a long time since I've seen it. I have seen it once full through, but it's one that I usually catch bits and pieces of. But yeah, that curb stuff, the idea of just biting the pavement and then getting your head. Oh, yeah. For me in the movie, it wasn't it wasn't the stomp because the way they angle like you're not seeing it close up or anything. But before the stomp, mm-hmm. the actor literally was he biting put it. His teeth on the curb and you hear that noise of asphalt and a, teeth. A, enamel just yeah. oh man it's just like no, like uh, i would mind, have been terrified as an actor i would have been yeah. like That's nobody can saying. be within That's 15 why I was feet of me terrified when i saw it because because he gets his head stomped like off screen though but when i was seeing him i was like dude you're not gonna you like i get i get what you're doing you don't have to put your teeth on the pavement like that like what if you slip or what if you or what if somebody yeah. like trips yeah. and fall and then you like put your face oh man i was thinking the exact same thing like ugh. yeah and i don't i don't even really i don't have a big teeth thing but that that is horrific just that the noise the noise of it is yeah. oh <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious! But uh, this was fun. Was this, I, I, yeah. this was usually we we record for about like an hour and a half. 
for uh, about like an hour, 10 episode. But if you do decide to come on uh, with Spencer, Haley, and Jamie, uh, I'm going to have a better hard drive and everything like that. And I'm not going to have a time limit on that one, on that particular episode, <laughs> yeah. because, that, because that one is going to be the season finale episode. So, that so if it goes three, four hours, we're good with it. Yeah, Don't yeah. threaten me with a good time. <laughs> That's why I wanted to have uh, three, four people on, like the guests that we had. And seeing as how you all seem to be very, uh, very friendly with each other and know each other, yeah. it should make for a fun, light episode where everybody's kind of, you know, joking, having fun back and forth. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I would love to come on. So um, just just keep me updated. And, you know, as you can see, I can sit here and talk about movies all day. It really... F- I'll, some people know this, but film film was my first love. And I I was pretty serious about going to film school for a little while. And, you know, even from a young age, I've been, you know, like I will watch movies with the director's commentary on because oh, I'm just so movie. fascinated okay. with, you know, the making of. And so I, I love, love, love film. So, you know, anytime you want to have me back, I'm I'm here for it. And it doesn't even have to be horror. Oh, well, I was going to say recommend to you if you go on netflix um uh, i don't know if you know that tv series the movies that made us yeah I so i show. didn't yeah. i didn't know about the new season that came out with they the halloween two. and the friday the yeah. 13th episodes but spencer turned me on to that so yeah have, i'm about halfway have, through the second one but i did watch the halloween one yeah. i didn't watch the halloween one yet but they did two seasons of the movies that made us and then they have the christmas movies that made us and the halloween movies that made us and then yeah. a spin off of the toys that made us Mm. yeah i i I like action figures too i still have some like unopened yeah i'm sure they got some star wars stuff in there that you'll you probably like so i've got i've got this greedo action figure that is still like in pristine condition like it's still you know in the packaging and i have it bubble wrapped and it's in a box and has been for i haven't looked at it in like i don't know 10 years are you sure it's still even there I hope so, unless you know Michael Myers has come by and stolen it. <laughs> <laughs> the worst, the worst thing he could possibly do. Yeah, yeah. Character. We yeah. have you. You've seen him kill a lot of people, but you haven't seen how bad it can get. <laughs> you, you've never seen him torture a Star Wars fanboy <laughs> by opening all his action figures, getting his fingerprints all over it, <laughs> his grimy, dirty fingerprints, ruining the collector's value. Playing with them in the sand. Playing with them in the sand. <laughs> Taking it out in the hot sun where the wax can melt. <laughs> now you are talking some scary, scary stuff. <laughs> that, that might actually make for a funny uh, horror parody. But before we go ahead and sign out here, do you want to go ahead and tell people where they can find you? Yeah, so, you know, I have a website, thomasgloom.com. You can find out about my books there. But if you want to connect with me and get to know me, the best place is going to be Instagram and just, you know, at at Thomas Gloom. Um, I also, you know, I I respond to emails at Thomas Gloom 87 at gmail.com. But yeah, IG is the best place to find me and connect with me. And uh, thanks again for coming on the show. I had a blast talking about. Yeah, this is a lot of tangents. Talking about this was here. This was great. This was this was a lot of fun. And even though I host my own podcast and when people come on, I'm always trying to talk them down from being nervous. I found myself yeah. feeling nervous before we got on. But once we started, it, it's it's been good, you know, just literally talking with some movie nerds like myself. So usually five like... or ten minutes before I start recording, I'm like, all right. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Gotta shake but the nerves then, out. Yeah. What are then, these butterflies? Yeah. <laughs> but then the second I hit record and I'm like, Yo, what's good, everybody? Welcome to Buddy Bag. Yeah. Business face. Business face. Exactly. Well, you hear from, like, you know, stand-up comedians or people who actually perform. Mm -hmm. If they've been doing it for years, they still get nervous. Like, I was listening to Joe Rogan talk about it. Like, he still gets nervous before going on stage, so... I yeah. I met Robin Williams before he passed, and because uh, I, w- I was setting up the... Uh, he was doing a live event over here at, yeah. uh, at uh, the thing, and I was setting up all the equipment and he went and he came to introduce himself to the audiovisual crew. Now you've seen how over the top Robin Williams is like in front of people and on stage, but he's very reserved when he's talking to people behind the scenes. He, he, he looked like a 
a middle school kid his first day in a new school when he came up and he's like hello nice to meet you oh so this is the uh, audio vi-. i was like oh my god he's so sweet he didn't have to come and say hey to the grunt crew <laughs> and yeah but but then the second he got on stage he was robin williams yeah so- yeah. No, that's think. that's that's awesome. Giving credit yeah. where where credit is due, and that's why you know mm-hmm. when I look at like reader reviews or I get an email, whether it's good or bad, like I want to listen to it. I want to hear them out because they've taken the time to read my stuff, and then they've taken the next step to actually give me feedback. And I always want mm-hmm. to listen because at the end of the day, if this was just about me, I wouldn't publish my stories. But once I publish them, you know, I'm giving them away, and you know, we we should always be mindful of that. You know, and I'm sure you guys yeah. are. With your listeners as well but that that's cool you know and that's what community is about so that's that's great to hear that about robin williams i, d- I didn't know that about him yeah he was super yeah. sweet it was it was the year before his passing so oh wow so wow. that so that's so when when he heard that he passed that hit me extra hard mm. but, yeah yeah you, you you made a connection with him yeah. but uh on that very happy note thank everybody for sitting here and listening to a couple of nerds talk about halloween sometimes we, we talked a little bit about it. <laughs> yeah we got summoned and thank thomas gloom again for coming on our little podcast and hopefully we'll have you back in a couple of weeks with Haley and spencer yeah. and jamie we'll we'll keep you updated on that yeah. and i've been chris thomas broke rider dave thomas gloom <laughs> and thomas gloom don't forget gloom. that yeah <laughs> thanks everybody <laughs>